Troublesome times are here, filling men's heart with fear. Freedoms we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humble your heart to God, safe from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians away. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the saints shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care, Rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then shall fly, glory to share. Now Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All the saints shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the saved shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. I started preaching in the uh, month of December, just preaching in the church where I got saved. Levi Baptist Church I was 18 years old 1978 and uh, I would I taught a Sunday school class and I would preach when my pastor was out and uh, I uh, been preaching the same Christ I've been preaching the same resurrection I've been preaching the same calling away or rapture from the time I got saved and I'm still preaching it today and tonight I'd like you to take your Bible and open with me to the book of First Thessalonians and uh, I've seen a number of good men men that I love dearly turn from the faith and deny the great calling away and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it breaks my heart. Amen. A dear brother that I love and have helped support as a missionary for many years. I asked him straight up three times to tell me if he was going full preterist. And he denied it all three times. And then when I finally pinned him down and caught him in it, uh, he finally admitted it. And when he did, I broke fellowship with him. Now, I hope the man's saved, but I cannot be around a brother who denies the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus Christ with brotherly fellowship. Now, I still love him. And I would die for him. But I cannot support his heresy. Now here in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I want to share with you about the great calling away uh, that the Bible uh, is sometimes said to be the rapture. Even though the word rapture is not used in the Bible, the Bible does teach that there will be a great calling away. You can call it a rapture, you can call it whatever you want, 
But the Bible teaches it. Now, I don't teach it because of Schofield, and I don't teach it because of dispensationalism. I teach it because the Bible clearly delineates that Christ is coming again, and when He does, He's going to call out His children, and we're going to be called away from this earth to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. Now, if that's not Bible, I'm going, to, I'm going to quit the ministry. If I didn't believe that was the Word of God, I would walk out of this pulpit tonight, and I would never preach another sermon. That's how serious it is. Because when you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have pretty much denied the faith. Amen. Now the Bible tells us here in verse number 13, and I don't mean this toward any of you, because I know that you believe the truth of the Bible, but it breaks my heart. It really does. To see men who have been so grounded in the Word of God just... Just like that, turn away from the biblical truth. The Bible says here in chapter 4, let's get the context in verse 1. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, which means the inability to control yourself. He says... Uh, but even as the Gentiles which know not God that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified for God had not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness now to save a little time go to verse 11 he tells us that what we ought to do is that we ought to study, to be quiet, to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, here in Thessalonians, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and uh, Paul is telling them that uh, some people have denied the resurrection, and you're going to see that he tries to clarify the issue, because here we see that there, were, there was evidently a question about brethren concerning them which are asleep, that is, those who have died. Now, there's a lot of different ideas about uh, what happens when we die. I think the Bible's pretty clear, though. The Bible says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I believe that when you leave this earth and you die physically, uh, you go, if you're saved, to be with Christ. If you're not saved, you go into a place of purgatory or hell, not purgatory, but hell or judgment. And um, the Bible tells us here, he, don't want us, he doesn't want us to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. And here it notes this, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So there were a lot of folks whose family was dying, and they were so overwhelmed with grief that they just couldn't function. You know, in my years of pastoring and ministry, I have run into people who just could not get over the death of a loved one. I mean, they just couldn't do it. When I was at Corbin, Kentucky, we had a, a man and his wife. They were very faithful members, good people, loved the Lord. And um, his wife got cancer. She had a long struggle with cancer and died. 
Well, he would never come back to church. I went to visit him. I don't know how many times I called him. I tried to encourage him. And he said, I, I just don't want to do nothing. He said, since my wife died, I don't care about nothing. I don't even want to live. And I said, listen, I said, the Lord wants you to live, and the Lord wants you to go on and live your life because he left you here on this earth. But he could not get over it. And he never came back to church. And as far as I know, he never went to any church. And so he became very backslidden, cold and indifferent, but he could not get over the death of his wife. Now, I could give you a number of illustrations of people that I've ministered to who lost a loved one, and it ruined them. It destroyed their life. They just could not deal with it. Amen. That's why I try to emphasize that you do not worship your wife. You do not worship your husband because... Our, our partnership could be dissolved just like that. Our lives could end and the Lord could take either one of us home in the twinkling of an eye. Could be a car wreck. Could be who knows how we're going to go. But if your partner dies, yes, we ought to grieve for them. And yes, it would be an awful thing. But don't let it destroy your life. God wants you to go on and serve Him and bring honor to His name. Don't let anything in this world except Christ become your God. Now notice he says, as we look a little further, he says, For if you believe, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died, now there's a whole lot that goes with that, you have to believe what the Bible says about how Jesus died. We know that, that Jesus did, he didn't have his life taken from him. He laid his life down. In the Gospel of John, he said, No man can take my life from me, but I lay my life down. That was why he came to this earth, was to live a perfect life and to die. But that was only part of the gospel. But if you believe that Christ died and rose again. Now you've got to believe the resurrection the way the Bible declares it. That Christ was crucified on the cross. That he hung there between heaven and earth upon that cross. And at the very exact precise second he gave up the ghost. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he died. He died a real death. He didn't swoon. He died. He didn't faint. He died. When they stuck the spear in his side, the soldier, out came water and blood, which tells us that pretty much his heart had dissolved. And out came water and blood. He was dead. They took him down from the cross. They put him in a borrowed tomb because he wasn't going to need it very long. And on the third day, he arose from the dead. That's all according to the scriptures. You have to believe it the way the scriptures tell us if you want to be saved. And then he goes on and he says, if we believe that he died that he rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now what's he talking about, God bringing them with him? Well, he's talking about the return of Christ. Now folks, there's a myriad of reasons why that did not occur in 70 A.D., I read an article today on 10 reasons why Jesus Christ did not come in 70 A.D. Now the full preterist and this brother I was talking about believes in 70 A.D. Christ came again. That's almost as bad as the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
who, who predicted I don't know how many different returns of Christ and he never did come according to their calendar. But I'm telling you, he is coming again. Now, I don't know when it is, and I will not set dates. I won't talk about, you know, people say, well, let me tell you about God's timetable. We've been on the earth 6,000, and then there's going to be a thousand-year millennium. We don't have any proof for that. We don't have no proof for that in the Bible. We don't know when Christ is coming. He could come tonight, or he may not come a thousand years from now. His coming is for sure, but we don't know when it is. And nobody should be setting dates. Only the Father has given the understanding. And, and people say, well, the Son's going to have to learn from the Father. I believe the Son is the second person of the Godhead. And He already knows when the coming's going to be. It's not that He's going to have to ask the Father to know. He already knows because He's... The, the second person of the Godhead but he's going to come and he says here now those of you who are all upset and you're afraid that your family's never going to be able to be revived again or resurrected the Bible says he's going to bring those with him that sleep for if we believe that Jesus died, rose again, even so then also, even so also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So when the Lord returns, he's going to come to the earth, he's going to come in the air, and he's going, there's going to be the, we're going to learn a little bit more about it, there's going to be a trump sound, and the trump of God will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. The people who have already died are in their graves physically, but their bodies, their spirits have gone to be with the Lord. And when Christ comes back, their spirit will come back into the body and they'll be resurrected with a glorified body. And notice what he says. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now Paul uses this phrase several times. And whenever he uses this phrase, he says this is not something that I've heard or something that somebody's told me, but this has come to me by revelation of God. This I tell you by the word of God. And here's what he says. The word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or shall not hold back or stop them which are asleep. So brothers and sisters, if we're alive until the coming of the Lord, our lives are not going to hinder or stop the resurrection of the dead who are saved. Amen. And he says, Them which are asleep, for the Lord himself, verse 16, shall descend from heaven. Notice it says the Lord himself. Now, if you look at some other passages, and I, I've got a bunch of other stuff here that... I want to look at hopefully before the message is over. But well, we see that this was promised by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. About every uh, funeral service that I do, I always read 1 Corinthians 15 or at least parts of it that have to do with the resurrection of the body. Now, this did not occur in 70 AD. This is future. This is yet to occur. And if we're alive unto the coming of the Lord, notice he says, He, the Lord Himself, you underline in your Bible, underline Lord Himself, because remember in the book of Acts chapter 1, when they were all standing watching Him ascend into the heavens, the angel appeared and told them, Why stand you here gazing? 
the same Jesus, same Jesus, you saw ascend in the heaven, shall so come again as you have seen him go. That's what they told them. Now, when Jesus left this earth, uh, it was about 33, 34 A.D., right in the middle there. He had lived 33 years, or in his 33 year, 33rd year, he died, he was buried, raised from the dead, and he ascended. He spent those days with the disciples after his resurrection, teaching them the Word of God and expounding. And they didn't want him to go, but as he ascended, they watched him in a cloud, and he went further and further. When I was a little boy, I, I used to, I couldn't wait for March, because I'd always fly a kite, and I'd see how high I could get a kite. I've had like 10 balls of string on a kite before, and I'd get it up so high. Uh, one of my neighbors showed me how to put a tail on it and, and get it higher, and I would try to get my kite so high you couldn't see it. I guess that's what they talk about hiring a kite, but I'd just stand there looking, and I'd, I, I'd get to where I couldn't even see it. And I would tie it to a, a post, and I'd run in and tell my mom, Mom, come out. I've got this kite so high you can't even see it. And my mom would come out, and she'd look, and she'd look, and, and then she'd see the string with it going up, and then usually you get a big wind gust and snap. <laughs> And then you got lines stretched out for a half a mile all over the neighborhood. And you try to wind it all back up. But they stood and they watched him. And as he went, he went further and further and further until he disappeared. So the Bible says he's going to descend from heaven with a shout. A shout. Wow, what? I looked that word up in the, in the Greek. That word shout means to cry out with a voice so loud that it's almost indiscernible. You ever heard somebody just make such a shriek so loud that you, you don't know what, what in the world that was? But the, there's going to be a shout. I don't know what he's going to shout. Maybe he's going to say, the Lord cometh. I don't know what he's going to say, but the Bible says he's going to come with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now I want to tell you something. When the trump of God sounds, you'll know it. I want to tell you, now you think about this for a moment. If the Lord had already returned like some of these brethren are claiming, when did the trump sound? No historian ever wrote about the trump in 70 AD. Nobody ever said the earth shook from a trumpet and we don't know where it came from. But I guarantee you when that trump of God sounds, this whole earth is going to shake. The trump of God shall sound, and then notice what it says. There will be a voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ. I tried to count up the other day how many funerals I've preached, and I couldn't even count them. I preached hundreds and hundreds of funerals. And then I've gone to many, many more funerals where I didn't preach. I've seen a lot of people die in my life. When I was a little boy, people would die. It would scare me so bad. I found my neighbor dead when I was just about five, six years old. And... Uh, Gay Terry was his name. It was a terrible thing for a little boy to go through. Amen. But uh, one day if I live to see it, and even if I don't live to see it, it's going to be just as good. 
because I'm going to rise, my body's going to be reunited with my spirit, my soul, and I'm going to rise. Amen. You're going to rise. Amen. We're all going to die. Our bodies are, are corruptible. They're, you know, we, we, every day we see how finite we really are. And I wouldn't be alive today if, if the Lord hadn't preserved me. Motorcycle wrecks, car wrecks, probably many of you have had the same thing in your life. You know, uh, I was telling the doctor about how many things I'd had happen to me in my life, and he said, boy, you've had a rough life. I said, but I'm alive. I know why I'm alive. I'll tell you, I'm not alive because of luck. I'm alive because of a sovereign God who kept me alive. Car wrecks I went through, motorcycle wrecks I went through. Only way that I could have lived was the protective hand of God was on me. And after it was over, I looked at it and I thought, how in the world did I live? But one day, if I get to live to see the coming of the Lord, it don't bother me that the dead are going to rise first. This is you. No, the Bible says the dead are going to rise first. And then, verse 17, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. You going to take that out of the Bible? You going to get your pen knife and cut it out? What are you going to do with it, full preterist? Right there it is. Notice what he says. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There it is. Black and white. Word of God. You going to deny that? I'm not going to deny it. By the grace of God, you put me in the, you put me on the, stack of wood to burn me alive I'm not going to deny it if God will give me grace to bear the pain I'm not going to deny it I'll never deny it and we've got men who say they love God and they love the truth and they just take the Bible and shred it apart it's a shame and a disgrace before God And we will be caught up together with them in the clouds. I didn't fly on an airplane until I was up in my 20s. And I remember the first time that I flew, we got up there. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get up there and see the clouds. Because I often thought about the coming of the Lord in the clouds we got up there, and that plane just flying along, and you're looking out your window, and you're seeing all these beautiful, fluffy clouds. And it made it so real. And here he tells us that the Lord is going to come, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Just like Jesus went up in the clouds, we'll be called up into the clouds. Now then we're going to walk on clouds. You know, when I was a little boy, I thought you could walk on clouds, but you can't. Uh, Kathy and I used to, we'd go out to the park and we'd watch the clouds and we'd find all kinds of animals and stuff in the clouds. And I was a little boy, I used to think, boy, if I could just get up those clouds, I could walk on them. I couldn't, I can't today, but one day I will. One day I'll just go right through them. I won't have to walk on them. And then I want you to notice this. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to meet Him in the air. How far up? Is it going to be 100 feet? 300 feet? 500 feet? A mile? I don't know. Nobody knows. The Bible doesn't tell us. But we're going to be called up together to meet the Lord in the air. And then I love this part. I've got it underlined about three times in my Bible. And so shall we ever, ever be 
with the Lord. The Kyrios, the Anointed One, the Christ, the Messiah, the only Redeemer of man, the Creator of heaven and earth. Man did not evolve. Evolution is one of the biggest lies. Charles Darwin is going to have a heavy price to pay for the wickedness that he promoted in evolution. And I believe if Charles Darwin were alive, he would renounce evolution because the things that he predicted they would find, they have never found. But they still go on believing their lie. Oh, they'll say, oh, we've been here millions of years. No, we haven't. The earth is only thousands of years old. It's not millions of years old. We didn't evolve through evolution. God created us. And at the Tower of Babel, God scattered man over the whole face of the earth. He confounded their languages. And there were people put in America, South America, Alaska, Canada, everywhere. They didn't have to come on a land bridge from Alaska to Kentucky and, and the northern America. I believe God scattered them then. And they've been here. We've seen different uh, people who have lived and died. Now, Paul was writing to a Gentile congregation and they were all converted as Gentiles. And they had been introduced to Christ and the gospel. Paul had clarified his teachings with uh, several important points. These included issues of eschatology. Eschatology is a big word. It just simply means a study of last things. Eschatology. Eschatology. Study of last things. That's all it is. What's going to happen in the end? People use a lot of big words to try and confuse people. But what's going to happen in the end? That's what Paul is talking about here. What happens at the end of life and at the end of time? It seems that since Paul's departure, some in the church who had been believers had died and he hadn't covered that particular situation since he believed that Jesus' return was rather imminent that it would be soon. And now he has to assure them that their friends and loved ones have not missed out on anything. Just because you've got members of your family who have died, you don't have to be concerned that if they were saved that they're going to miss out on anything. They're not. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. They're with Him now. Paul says that if you believe that Jesus died, and you believe that He rose from the dead, this is the basic Christian affirmation of the gospel. Then you can also believe that God will raise our loved ones. How will He do this? Well, Paul gives us a sense by grasping these ideas that he employs through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those who are asleep, that word sleep is referring to death. It's re, it, that word, the, the Hebrew phrase or the Greek phrase means to take a long journey, uh, to leave your family behind. Sometimes they would take trips that would be years and they'd be gone and they would use this word. And Paul says that when you grieve as those who have no hope, it's inappropriate. Now, it's nothing wrong with a person grieving over the death of their loved one. But when you continue after a year, I, I, from what I learned in, in uh, Bible college, you go through shock after the death of a loved one for about a year. And during that year, you should not make any kind of important decisions. During that year, 
you are, are trying to come through the, tra the trauma of a death of someone close, and it is a very difficult time in life. That's why pastors will tell their congregation, don't make big decisions for the first year. Try to just make basic decisions because you may make some big decision that you're going to later regret big time. Paul's confidence on this matter rests on the word of the Lord. He's already covered this in 1 Corinthians 15. He's recovered this in Romans 8, 1 through 11. And the Bible tells us the closest word of the Lord is that preserved is in Mark 13, 26 and 27 and Matthew 24, 30 and 31. There Jesus described the Son of Man returning in the clouds and the angels gathering His elect from the four corners of the earth to meet Him. Now the Lord Jesus didn't believe in a flat earth. The four corners of the earth was just a phrase to say that He's going to get them all. No matter where you are in the east, west, north, and south, the Lord's going to get you. He's going to return, and no one will be left out. What isn't specific in the gospel account is that the dead believers precede the living ones. So Paul seems to be referring with a general discussion of Jesus giving us the tales which he knows and presents to the congregation. Now remember, Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Remember? And he heard things and saw things that were not lawful for him to communicate. That's right. But here, he tells us. The fact that the Lord made his pronouncement makes it even more comforting. The Bible tells us that when we... Uh, I want you to look at verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Is there any more comforting words than to know that we don't have to be afraid of death? That we're not going to languish in the grave, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What a comfort that is. A couple years ago, I went to see a man in the hospital and he was on his last days of life, very sick, barely could open his eyes. And I shared with him the gospel. And I prayed with him, and the man afterwards told me that he had, he had believed upon Christ and asked him to come into his heart and save him. And I went to see him another time before he died, and he told me that day, he said, Pastor, those words that you told me have brought me more comfort than anything I've ever heard in my life. He said, you'll never know what those words have meant to me in the last few days. To know that I'm going to be with the Lord. Trumpets will sound there will be a great shout, angels descending from heaven. It is in verse 17 that is birthed these reflections of the end time, of the rapture, of the great calling away. Just because uh, the word rapture is not in the Bible doesn't mean that it is not a valid truth because the understanding of it is clearly in the Bible. The term that Paul uses is arpadza, which means to snatch away. Snatch away. One of the things I've always done since I was a little boy is catch flies. I see a fly sitting there. I put my hand down like this, and I, <coughs> I grab it. Kathy said, you didn't catch it. I open my hand there, it flies away. Uh, catch him, snatch him. You know... Here, the, the word that Paul uses means that he's going to snatch us away. 
What a blessing. And typically in the New Testament, it's used in a negative connotation of being forced. I looked at about five or six passages, Matthew 11, 12, Matthew 12, 29, Matthew 13, 19, John 6, 15, and I could give you a whole bunch more, but all of those have the idea of forcing, of grabbing you and taking you. Jerome in the Latin translation used the word rapper, R-A-P-E-R-E, -E, from which our English word rapture comes from. But in modern language, it's important to note that here Paul asserts that believers will meet the Lord in the air and involves no intricate, timeless, or charts. Those that have been imported from other passages uh, to say something they don't say should be ignored. Take the Bible. Let the Bible speak. Don't follow man's opinion. I don't care who the man is. I don't worship men. I worship God and I worship the Bible or I believe the Bible. I worship God but I believe His Word. And that's what we're called to teach and believe, the Word. Now I'm going to die here before long, maybe in a few years I'm going to die. And when I'm gone, the Lord will raise up another man who's going to be your preacher. You don't need to follow me then, you'll need to follow him as your pastor, whoever he is. You don't make a God out of a man. You don't lift a man up more than you ought. Because just like Paul, Paul said, who am I? Who is Barnabas? Who is Peter? We're just instruments. It's God that we're to glorify. Here at least Paul does not go into discussion of what happens to those who are not believers. That's because I think it's assumed that if you're not, if you're not saved, you'll be left. You're not going to be taken. Uh, when the Lord calls you away, uh, the judgment of God, I believe, is going to simultaneously fall upon this earth, even though Paul doesn't talk about it here. He does in other passages. So we don't have to be afraid to use the word rapture. And uh, Jesus' return should be a thing that we anticipate and that we celebrate, not explain away. No fear. If you happen to return home and find that there's no one there, don't be afraid because you're his child. Many years ago, I went on a fishing trip with a brother, and this man had wrote the book 80, 87 or 88 Reasons Why Christ Was Coming in 87, and then he wrote it again in 88. And we were out, uh, way out in the wilderness. And on that day, I got up about an hour before he did, and I went out in the woods, and I took my clothes and hung them up on a tree. <laughs> and he'd come out of that tent about an hour later, and he was saying, Tony, Tony! And we'd already been talking about if the rapture occurred, and he didn't know if he was saved or not. And uh, it was kind of fun, but in the same manner, it was very serious because later he got saved. And uh, this is not an escapist theory because while Paul says that believers will dwell with the Lord, he doesn't say that the dwelling will always be in the air. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 21, Revelation 21, more about the dwelling place that will be on a renewed earth. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, and new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven and rest upon a new heaven and a new earth. It offers the blessed hope that all those in Christ, living and dead, will be there on the day when He will come again in glory and then dwell with Him forever. Father in heaven, we thank You, Lord, for the blessed promises of the Bible.
for the glorious coming of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I'd lie if I didn't say that my heart has been broken. Some of my dear brothers that I love so much have turned away from the truth. Lord, I know that that's in your hands. And I pray for those that have erred from the faith that you would help them to read their Bible and believe the Word of God. Bless your people. Comfort them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, please, Brother Jim.